Okay, continuing on with our study of Esther, picking up in chapter 5, verse 3. Good discussion last week on uh, Esther's moving into the throne room to talk to the king. And we talked about the Lord uh, moving in all these various ways. But in verse 3, then the king asked, now she had come into the outer court against the law. He held out the scepter, which welcomed her, which uh, enabled her not to be killed for violating the law. So we're picking up with that. Then the king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? This is New International Version. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given you. So it must have occurred to Xerxes, King Xerxes, Ahasuerus, that something was up and it was <coughs> quite important for Esther to come in violation of law and was literally casting herself upon his whim as to whether she lived or died. But of course it wasn't just up to the king. The power of God obviously was working on him at the same time. But the king's pleasure is revealed in the statement that he gave to Esther. And he said, an invitation, what is it, Queen Esther? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given you. And this wasn't just a political politeness, because the, the historian Herodotus records how another woman who was offered this invitation by Xerxes asked him for a robe that one of his wives, whose name was Amestris, had given him. And for him to fulfill this, it eventually ended up with his brother and his entire family being killed as a result of the king honoring what he had offered as to this, to this woman that, you know, up to half the kingdom I'll give you. And it wasn't just a, a political niceness or politeness. So when he asked this of Esther, evidently there was some seriousness to it. But it's, it's, it's kind of a surprise when we read her response. But we know, chapter 4, Mordecai said, Go to the king, plead for your people. Okay, everybody fast for three days and three nights. and Then, you know, I'll go into the king. If I perish, I perish. And the king says, What do you want up to half the kingdom? <coughs> if it pleases the king, verse 4, replied Esther, Let the king, together with Haman, come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Wait a minute, do what? You have had all the Jews fasting. You have been fasting. You took your life in your hands to come before the king. And he offered you half the kingdom. And you say, I need you to, I'd like for you to come over and eat. You, you kind of um, wonder, really, Esther, come over and you, you invited him to a banquet. Why invite the king to a banquet when, when the whole population of the Jewish people is on the line? What do you think was up with this? Some commentators note that maybe she recognized that she'd already pushed the envelope pretty hard by just simply coming to the king. And that maybe it really wasn't the best time now to um, say, okay, I want you to rescind or I want you to change this order that Hank had done. Some commentators yeah, you know, that. Or is it that if she asked then and he said no, when she said, "Well, you said, well, he could deny," it, but if they did it in front of people, then yeah, when well, there's a bank, there's wine, there's wine, there's drink, 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 there's drink,
Yeah. Maybe, maybe softening humor. <clears throat> to put it, create a little, uh, well, a little sense of suspicion. Even and, and today, women do it. You know, if you want your husband to do something, what are you going to do? You're going to do something nice for him first. Remember that, Bobby. You heard. Uh, What's the truth? We all. <laughs> FYI, she's it's nice to me nice all the time. And, uh, and then they yeah. think it's his idea, and you got it. Uh, <laughs> so we have some. She actually is using marketing strategy. And what would be that strategy? Just, you know, uh, butter up. Butter up. Butter up. I'm going to show up a good time. So have a good time. All this, you know? Yeah. So, you know, any any and all of these. And we could we could ask that maybe this was God through the Holy Spirit checking to use a I think right this morning. I know that's a that's a, that's a unusual for me, isn't it? Yeah. Um, maybe the Holy Spirit was checking it. Maybe she came with the full intention of asking him, and just as we often have had when we were getting ready to do something, we just get that little check in our heart. That, mm, no, 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 not right now. It, it's just interesting, though, when we think about it, of all that had gone into it, all the fasting, all of the effort, all of the angst, the fear, the anxiety, so you would think, after all the fasting, and we have to assume prayer that went in probably with this, do you think Esther moved too quickly? I see some head checking. Mm -mm, nope. No. Or is the question, does God's timetable operate to include our supplications? but in his moment, in his time frame. I think that that may be, I think all of these were probably involved, certainly. And I think God took all of that together when he checked her for that. <coughs> Does moving in the will of God always mean that we're moving correctly? <laughs> you know, sometimes we put our little, our little stamp on it and messes it up. Yeah. And I, I think we see in, in this passage Esther being sensitive to the Holy Spirit's guidance, even in the midst of spiritual focus, fasting for three days, and going into the king. And for whatever reason, and we have to assume that it was divine in nature because of how it all played out the Holy Spirit said mm, no not right here not right now invited him to a banquet invited him to come eat at, at the room or place wherever it is and I think it's interesting that we see in Esther not only in this scene but throughout the book we see perhaps more so than in many other places in Scripture the intersection of humanity, spirituality, and the struggle to lean upon God in the midst of an unbelieving country. We see flashes of this all through the Old Testament, but the whole book of Esther, as we've gone through it, is really <clears throat> two people who believed in God <laughs> who were trying to serve him, but were caught up in the midst of a people, of a country, of a government that did not believe in God. You know, we've seen Mordecai and Esther try and find and walk the line between faith and sin as they faced Esther being taken into the king's harem. Mordecai's demand to withhold information as to her nationality We've seen Mordecai wrestling with what he had practiced in other places, but he would not practice it to an Amalekite to bow. He 
he obviously had bowed to the king. He went bound to the Amalekite. And now he's ordering Esther to reveal her people. And we have Esther going into the king, trying to overturn the law of an empire that was going to bring a vicious, greedy king literally tons of profit. It's just interesting that as we read Esther, Esther's a beautiful story just in reading it. But there's so much more that as we dig down into it, it really talks about how do you make it, how do you live in the midst of an unbelieving country? Have any relevance for us today, maybe? Mm -hmm. I was thinking. Yeah. <clears throat> how, do we, how do we make it? How do we go through? How do we handle living, working, maintaining a livelihood, maintaining a life in the midst of an unbelieving group of people? And I think that, you know, some of the lessons that we have seen so far, you know, in the book of Esther are really, are really powerful. So let's, let me get my eraser. I didn't take that thing out a while ago. Let's think about that a little bit. What are some, uh, a little bit of reading, I'll just change colors. What are some life lessons that you have seen in Esther, in our study? What are some things that, that, that have stood out to you as we've gone through these, you know, part of five chapters now in the book of Esther. What are some life lessons that, that you have taken away? And if you don't have any, I'm really going to be disappointed. You know what I'm saying? I would say <laughs> patience. She is very patient. Patience. Okay. What else? What's, what's, a, what's a life lesson for you out of, out of Esther, out of our studies that we've had? These, these are good lessons, you know, these are good things to really, you know, as we pull out, how do we live in the midst of an unbelieving country, of an unbelieving people? And it does. You know, being loyal in the midst of an unbelieving people. Maybe your job, maybe the people you, you have to associate with, you know. Uh, whatever, to be able to still be loyal and be loyal to them as well as be loyal to our Lord. I mean, to be able to navigate that is, is, is an accomplishment, you know, in, in this life. And these may seem like, oh, well, yeah, I hear these things almost every Sunday and somewhat, yeah, but think about them in light of the, of the implication, you know, the implementing, the, the practice that we see in the book of Esther. 
some of the other things that, that we've noted that don't allow social settings to dictate your values. Remember, that was Bash time. And the king getting drunk. Well, uh, tell Bash to come in here. Her values were much stronger and higher than his. It cost her. But don't allow social settings to dictate the values. And you know, don't place yourself at a disadvantage in your witness by saying too much too early. Remember, Mordecai told us, now don't tell the king who you are. Don't tell him that you're a Jew. And we talked about that, about whether that was good, bad, or ugly, what you were. But, you know, don't place yourself at an automatic disadvantage if you don't have to in your witness. And if you're in a difficult situation, try to put yourself in the best light that you can. You know, right here in this passage, when she came in, we talked about it last week, she put on her royal robes. She dressed to impress. She wanted that split second when the king saw her to just, you know, blow him away. And she tried to put herself in as good a light as possible. One of the things we've talked about a lot is be, a, be as good a citizen as you can. You never know how God is using that for a future goal. Mordecai informing the king or in telling Esther about the two guys that were going to assassinate the king. Was, was Xerxes a good king? No, he, he, was, he, was, he was a bad king. So the next king could have Next king, you know, better the devil you know than the devil you don't, is the old saying. And, you know, so he, being a good citizen, informed on that. Even though Xerxes wasn't a great guy. But they got him an ace in the hole. Got him an ace in the hole for future good. And, you know, because later on, and we'll see this in chapter 6, the Holy Spirit used that, that whole scenario, to embarrass the king, in a sense. And he turned it around and said, I need to do something for this guy. We haven't done it. We haven't rewarded him. Who's in the court? Haman. Oh. And you can almost, you almost, you know, see angels in heaven. Watch God do this. Look at him. Look at him. Watch this. You know. It's almost, it's almost, it's, it's amusing when we look at it from that standpoint. One, another lesson that, that we've talked about is know where your lines are that you will not cross and be ready to pay if you decide this is a line I can't go over. Just know where it is, what it's going to cost you, or that it's going to cost you. I'm going to do that. You know, we, we have, we have I, have, I have a daughter that is like that. Uh, at least as she grew up. I think she's probably a little more balanced now. But when she was growing up, she would decide whether it was worth the cost. And to her, if it was worth the cost, go ahead. I'm going to do it anyway. And being able to Try to redirect some of that was a challenge for this daddy growing, you know, when they were growing up. But it's also a good thing that um, to have that level of stubbornness. If you can get a channel in the right direction, for stubbornness to be a positive thing, that's that's a, that's a good thing. Nobody's going to just change their mind either, you know. Social settings will not have the same impact as someone who might, you know. Well, I want people to like me, and I want people to this, I want people to that. Then, then people are going to, they'll direct you wherever they want to direct you, you know. But a good case of stubbornness sometimes can, can be a good thing. Not that their daddy is stubborn or anything, you know. <clears throat> just saying, ma'am. Just grumpy. Just grumpy, yeah. Yeah, I, I, need, I need me a t-shirt that says grumpy old man. I really do. <laughs> I would wear it. I can guarantee I would. You get that one, I get to go out and be in a race and wear them again. <laughs> there you go. Nobody be able to tell us apart. <laughs> and then another lesson is that in all of life, realize that God knows how to connect the dots of experience to work for our good in Him. There are so many things, and we're going, we're going to do a graphic. I don't know that I'll get to it this week, but we're going to do a graphic. 
uh, of some of these dots and just see how they all came together. And it could only be God that, that was able to see all the dots out here, know where they were going to be, and see how they could all work together to come at the right time, right place, right moment to bring about his will. And out of our passage here that we just looked at, be sensitive to the timing of God in the moment. It, it seems kind of odd. A banquet, Esther, after everybody's prayed, after everybody's fasted. Yeah, well, I felt that check from the Holy Spirit. And I need to be sensitive to God's timing. Rather than just what, you know, than my timing. It could well be. Everybody's fasting. Everybody's praying, yes, we, this is the moment. Well, the Holy Spirit knows more than I do. I need to listen to him. Paul encountered it when he was endeavoring in the book of Acts to go into certain places to preach and was forbidden to go preach by the Holy Spirit. How many pastors and preachers have ever heard a sermon on how God forbid me to preach? I mean, you know, it's not a sermon that you hear a lot. Paul was forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go into some areas because God knew where he wanted him to be. Not that preaching was bad, no. Not that, needed, not that there wasn't lost people out there. Yes, there were. But the leading of the Spirit was for this direction and this way. And so we just need to be sensitive to that. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, it's we can use all of these other things as a cover to say, well, when the time comes that I do need to take a stand, I do need to step up, well, really I just need to be patient. I really, I really need to do this. Really, really I need to do that. Esther was being pretty bold. Even though she was following the Holy Spirit, being checked, she was pretty bold here. I mean, when you step into that out of throne room, it was Persian law. You die if the king hadn't called you unless he holds the scepter out to you. And this was a man who we've seen work by whim. So that, that's pretty bold. Her life was within seconds of being taken. That was pretty bold. Indeed. Other life lessons that you've seen as we've gone through? So, Esther has said in verse 4, Let the king together with Haman come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asked. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine, Brad, Brad's point earlier, you know, as they were drinking wine, the king again asked Esther, now, what is your petition? It will be given you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Esther replied, my petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favor, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman, Haman come tomorrow to the banquet I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Haman went out that day happy and in high spirit, for when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. So, interestingly, even when they came to the banquet and they were drinking wine, making them in high spirits happy, and the king said, okay, what do you want? Up to half the kingdom. I want you to come back tomorrow. I'll feed you. Then I'll tell you what it is. Once again, the suspense, the anticipation, the patience that she was, you know, she was, she was working this thing. This wasn't marketing, you know. She was working this thing. And the passage says that Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits. It's really kind of interesting. Haman, you're happy and in high spirits about your own downfall. He just had no clue. 
It's, it's just amusing to read it within that passage of Scripture. However, we're given in, this, in these verses, you know, a little indication that even when God is working his will, Satan is going to try his best to disrupt that work. Now, it seems Mordecai had shed all of his mourning garments. He was back at work. He was back at King's Gate. And Haman, as he's, you know, you can almost see Haman just kind of bouncing out of him. For, you know, throne room. He's he's the king, and Esther. You know, he's you know he's he's feeling he's feeling good at this time. And maybe he looked for Mordecai. You know, to say maybe now you'll recognize just how big a man I am, and you'll bow like you want to to me. It wouldn't it wouldn't have changed his mind about killing him, but you know. But Mordecai not only would he not bow, he wouldn't even stand up in this in the man's presence. When he saw Mordecai at the king's gate, you can't help but wonder if he was looking for him. And observed that he neither rose, before we've always been talked about you know, him bowing. Well, he would have bowed to show fear, he would have stood to show respect, and he's saying, I ain't showing you neither one, Malachi. He was filled with rage. Hang on to that idea that he was filled with rage. Upon coming home, verse 10, Haman restrained himself, yeah, and went home. Calling together his friends and Zeresh, his wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him, and now he had elevated him above other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave. And she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. Just, and here's another characteristic of Antichrist. There's several characteristics we've pointed to in the book. Extreme arrogance and self-centeredness. He called his family together and boasted about his wealth, his sons, the ways that the ways the king had honored him, how he had elevated him, and now Esther has invited me as if nobody else had had any hand in any of his success in life. Arrogance, self-centeredness is a hallmark of the devil. It's a hallmark of sin being in control of a person's life. It was a hallmark, and it will be a hallmark. It was a, it was a hallmark of Haman. It will be the hallmark of Antichrist. But this gives me no satisfaction, as long as the passage says, as I see this Jew. Verse 13. As I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. Now, you know, you would think that after he had gone through all of the bragging that he had just gone through and all the honor that was his, all the power that was his, you know, Mordecai would be just a mosquito. Just, you know, shoo him away, swat at him, and just ignore him. This, this, this nobody Jew over here, because you are a great man. But part of vanity and pride is that it is very fragile. And the least perceived smudge on that vanity and pride destroys all confidence and sense of accomplishment. Look at what he says here. And, and this, this, you know, it's so interesting to look at this behavior and that somebody who has this sense of how great they are can be so destroyed in their mind by somebody so small as Mordecai. Vanity and pride is a powerful emotion. It's a difficult thing in a person's life, but it is very fragile. Because it seems that the least little thing can just tear it all down in their mind. 
And you wonder if Haman reached his position through deception and wile and craft instead of genuine accomplishment. Because one of the things that, that contrasts to me in my mind, and I think and to many others, is that knowing what you have been able to do in life is something that nobody can erase. If you know what you have accomplished, and it might not be that your face is on Mount Rushmore, but you know what you've been able to accomplish in life. Nobody can take that away from you. But if a life is built on surface vanities, then surface problems produce deep-seated fear, anger, and hate. That's what we see in, in Haman. A man who is, on the face of it, is just almost the most powerful man in the empire. And he is just distraught over this one little Jew who won't show him respect. Kind of makes you wonder, how did you get to that place? Do you have any genuine sense of accomplishment of what you've done? Because neither Haman nor Jew could take that away from you. And I think that, you know, it just, it hits me to really think, you know, what makes you feel important? What are the real things that make you feel that sense of accomplishment? And I speak that to myself. Is it surface things that if somebody else doesn't like it, it just, oh my, I'm just tore up. Or, yeah. Excuse me for interrupting you. No. That sounds like to me, labor inspired. Your brother there is preaching. Say it again. Labor inspired. Favor ain't fire. Fire. Fair. Fair. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, these old ears. I just, just. Yeah. Favor ain't fair. That is an excellent point. And it's not. And if you build your life around, and this is one thing we see with kids Facebook, Instagram, all those grams and isms and whatever it is they do, I don't know how to do them. I, you know, don't go on them, don't fool with them. But it's amazing how many people are just, and we, had, we, we, we hear of, of teenagers committing suicide because of what somebody put on their Instagram or the face page about. And, and if you just, if you're bent to have and seek favor for favor's sake, it ain't gonna be fair. And you're gonna be hurt and you'll be vulnerable. But to have a sense of knowing who you are and what you have done, that's something that, you know, nobody can take that away from you, regardless of what they put on whatever book page or whatever it is. And as we think about Haman's rage and Satan's work through it, he was filled with rage. Why should that even bother you? But this is another aspect and a characteristic of Antichrist. Haman wanted worship from all. Anything less attack in his mind his supremacy. Antichrist is going to seek, demand, and deceive worship from the world, especially the Christian associated, Christian associated nations. And any that will not, and that would be us, he will seek the individual death and the collective deaths of all and the root, which would be the Jews. Why does Antichrist have a covenant with the Jews? Why does Antichrist present himself as he, as Scripture says he will and not present himself in another format? Why not present himself as the greatest scientific mind of, the, of ever? Why not present himself as the political leader ever? Why is the focus on, on being the anti, of being the false messiah and having a covenant with the Jews? Because Satan knows that believers do not worship him, do not follow him, and he hates them. He's going to destroy them, and the root cause of it all is the Jewish people. He's going to try to destroy them too.
Why is he after the Jews? God's chosen people, and he can't stand that. Haman's wife and all of his friends offer him an outlet to this rage and his deflated ego. His wife, Zeresh, wouldn't you like to be married to a woman like her, guys? You know? And all of his friends think, have a gallows built, 75 feet high, and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go with the king to the dinner and be happy. Go murder somebody and go be happy. Eat you a chicken leg, you know? This suggestion delighted Haman, and he had the gallows built. I, you know, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that that was that was a uh, 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 yeah, yeah. I, I'm glad he had him. <laughs> I'm glad she had him. You know? <laughs> they they really did deserve each other. But you know, really, it also speaks to what hate does to us. And, you know, when I read that about, and I wonder about Mordecai's culpability in that too. I mean, I don't think he particularly liked Haman, you know. Oh, no. no yeah, they, no. they meet up, and I'm like, it just seems like they just hated each other so much that here Haman, right or wrong, he was having a pretty good day, or he thought he was, but that hate in him just mm -hmm. took it all away. Yeah. yeah. And that's what it does to us. Excellent point with that. And when you have when you have a life built around surface vanity and built around how everybody favors me, how everybody looks at me, and then somebody doesn't, <coughs> it deflates you, but then it does. It fills you with hate toward that person for no other reason. He had no other reason to hate Mordecai than that he wouldn't stand or bow and decided to wipe out a whole people because of that. I mean, that's, that's hate. I mean, that's deep-seated hate. Hang him high. That was, that was her and his friend's suggestion. And you kind of get the sense in reading that that this one man, Mordecai, was going to be a signal of Haman's victory over all the Jews. And in that sense, it reminds us of our Lord Jesus who was the one man that Satan thought if he could kill him, it would signal the message to the cosmos, the entire creation, and ever how many elements there are of this creation, that Satan had won against God. That was his intent on killing Jesus. But we're about to see that God has all the bases covered in battle with Satan. And it would be pictured in Haman's defeat. Haman didn't know it, but he was building his own gallows. Another little amusing side effect. Can't you imagine one angel punching the other thing? Watch it. See, Haman, what is Haman doing? That? Watch it. Guess what's going to happen? I think I know what's going to happen. Like going picking your own switch. Huh? Like going picking your own hickory switch. Like going picking your own yeah. <laughs> yeah, didn't you hate it? Yes, sir. Oh my. So we'll pick that up with chapter 6 next week. But um, interesting. I mean, it just keeps getting to me more and more as we look into it. Good discussion. Grab me some sausage. <laughs>